Uh, next, I want to go <clears throat> to a very special person for many reasons. One of the reasons why she's special is because she is a faculty member at Harvard Medical School and decided to fly in today for our forum. And she is also president of the Hassan Hattout uh, Foundation. And she's going to speak about her father's journey and, and her journey in terms of Palestine. Dr. Ibat Hattout. It was 1948 when Hassan Hattout, a Muslim Egyptian physician, had just graduated from medical school where he'd proposed to his future wife of 58 years. Rather than making their wedding date their priority, with my mother's agreement, my father volunteered to travel to care for the wounded in a war that had just emerged in a neighboring country called Palestine. There, he wrote daily memoirs, from which I shall translate two excerpts. I left Ramallah, he wrote, a beautiful city in Palestine. Yet, I feel I still live there. My memories there are vivid until my very last minute. I departed, but to this day I feel here is there, as if Cairo is just a transit point in my life. My days in Ramallah were green, filled with white, bright memories as alive as can be. I feel them with all my heart and to the full extent of my capacity to love and beyond. If only time could go back. If only time could go back. In another excerpt, Hassan Hathout wrote, I had just packed my medical instruments to go to my assignment in the Palestinian city of Ramla, a town of history and civilization. I started reading about its people, how they were keen on education and progress when the phone suddenly rang. The British radio announced the news. City after city were falling. There was a denial. There was disbelief. Most people advised me not to go. Palestine had changed. It was under new foreign control. I was a medical doctor from Egypt, which was regarded as the enemy. I called the Red Crescent and told them I was going anyway. In communication with the Red Cross, I was designated as the physician in charge of the hospital of the city of Ramla. This audience may wonder why a new medical school graduate would delay his residency training and volunteer to help the wounded in a country that is not his own. And the answer to those who knew him is simple. Hassan Hathout always put his faith first. As Muslims, we happen to believe in a full chain of Abrahamic prophethood descending from one common God through Moses and his message of justice, through Jesus and his message of love, and through Muhammad with his message of mercy. Hassan Hathoud was a man of God before and after he became a doctor. He saw that many of the world's conflicts were born out of hatred. He practiced and preached love.
For a devout Muslim, there is no land where the three Abrahamic religions are represented like they are in Palestine. There is no city where all three faiths are venerated like Jerusalem. That war came with a calling, and as Hassan Hathout frequently said, religion is a verb. As a Muslim and a physician, he was a firm believer in the sanctity of human life. In 1948, Dad went to Palestine to save lives. And now I'd like to share a story from my own childhood. My parents and I had gone to Austria for a summer vacation. Walking on the lake shore, we met and started a conversation with an elderly woman who told us she was an Israeli Jew. My father mentioned that he was an Egyptian Muslim and that he'd been a doctor in the 1948 war over Palestine. They exchanged names and addresses and said goodbye. Months later, my father received a letter relating to an incident that had happened 20 years earlier during his days in Palestine. While stationed in Ramla, my father had received a captured Israeli soldier who was shot with a bullet in his chest. A group of Palestinians who had just lost their homes, their loved ones, and their homeland walked in to attack the Israeli soldier. My father stood in front of him and told the group, over my dead body. He recited the words of the Quran, the same words found in the Jewish scripture, the Talmud. Whoever saves a life, it is as though they saved all humankind. He reminded them of the rights of the prisoners of war in Islam. The crowd left in peace. My father tended to the injured Israeli soldier as his patient, removed the bullet from his chest, took care of him for weeks, listened to him talk about his wife and young son. Days passed, and the Israeli soldier fully recovered. Dad called the Red Cross, who picked him up and transported him back to his army. The first news my father received of this man afterwards came 20 years later. It was that letter. Somehow, the man got our address from the Jewish lady we'd met in Austria. The essence of his letter was gratitude for having saved his life and an invitation to visit him in his newly established country. An invitation which my father politely declined. My father responded that he was happy to know that his former patient was alive and healthy. And he asked him about his son. At the same time, my father declined the invitation to visit, explaining that he could not do so when Palestinians had suffered so much injustice. Make no mistake, my father, though able to cherish the sanctity and humanity of all souls, including Jewish and Israeli souls, was also firm in his belief that grave injustice was being perpetrated against the Palestinians, and he never ceased believing so.
In fact, the reason why I never learned my mother's delicious Egyptian cookie recipe was because my father would not let her bake them anymore out of his grief over Palestine. Palestine has been lost, he'd say in Arabic, and you want us to eat cookies? A few years later, my father received a second letter. The first half was written by the same former Israeli soldier, extending niceties and another invitation for my father to visit. Then the writing was interrupted. New handwriting began. It was this man's wife who wrote, my husband had a heart attack and died. I found this letter in his belongings. I wanted to thank you for giving him 25 years of happy life with our son and family. On one level, my father and this man were ideologic enemies. On another, they were two men who were able to transcend their differences through a common humanity. The same humanity that brought my Muslim father, Hassan Hathout, with Rabbi Leonard Bierman in the 1980s to become a force for peace. They first met in California at a time of particular unrest taking place in Jerusalem and the West Bank. My father loved Leonard Bierman. When someone pointed out, you do know he is Jewish, <laughs> and my father replied, yes. I love his love of humanity. One of the other things the two men had in common was the courage to critique their own people. In the early 90s, my father had open heart surgery. As soon as I heard that the operation was over and he was out of the OR, I rushed to the hospital thinking I'd be the first to visit him. But I was not. When I pushed the elevator button, the door opened, and Rabbi Bierman appeared smiling and gave me directions to Dad's room. <laughs> he had visited him before me. I later asked myself why Rabbi Bierman went to my father's bedside in the first place, and so soon after his surgery. And I concluded that there must be a special bond between those who attain a certain closeness to God that brings them together and enables them to rise, to shed off worldly labels and become closer to a common source of light. Such that a Muslim like Hassan Hathout worked with Rabbi Leonard Bierman in this very church, together with Reverend George Regas, for the need to reverse the arms race, to call for the end of war, all war. They were a triangle of light that expanded to include my uncle Maher Hathout, the Reverend Ed Bacon, our Reverend Mike Kinman, Layla and Salam al Mariati, and many others who believe and fight for a better humanity. A humanity that allows people to feel the pain of others whether or not they agree with their ideologies. A humanity that yearns to protect the lives of innocent children, women, and men, regardless of the color of their flag. Ladies and gentlemen, 
the wars we are witnessing today are not only a monumental failure of diplomacy, but a devastating crisis of humanity. There is so much to grieve and so much to pray for. People of faith are particularly saddened at the degree of misinterpretation, misrepresentation, and weaponization of their religions. So much so that Rabbi Leonard Bierman devoted his very last temple sermon to reprimanding the killing of Palestinian children by some of his own people, telling them, somewhere on the road, we lost our moral compass. I remember when I was a child sitting on my father's lap watching the first Apollo moon landing. And I recall my father saying, isn't it a pity that man who was able to reach the moon is still not able to reach the heart of his fellow man? While we cannot cure the world, we can certainly do our part where we are with what we have, like the old story of the man who walked on the beach, rescuing one starfish at a time by tossing it from the sand back to the ocean so it can live. When someone told him there are hundreds of beaches with thousands of starfish, you won't make a difference, he replied as he tossed another starfish back into the ocean. I make a difference to this one. For the past two months, many of us have been in deep grief, hidden grief, perpetual grief. We learned how to shed silent tears as we watch a sad circus around us and a fractured humanity bleed. We ask God why. We pray and realize God must have a plan for each of us. Today we speak as Muslims in a church whose friendship we treasure. Once again, we extend our hands and open our hearts to all who are willing to work for a just peace, to endure the uncomfortable conversations, to resist mountains of hatred, and to make a difference wherever we can. I shall end with Hassan Hatout's words. Friends in faith, rise while you still have a choice on the wings of love soar above, and sing with your hearts not only your voice, God is love, God is love, God is love.